If you're considering a career in law, you're someone who assembles all the details, applies principles, and weighs evidence before making decisions. We believe that there's a compelling case to be made for you to study at the University of Pretoria's Faculty of Law, and we have the facts to back this up. With the faculty ranked best of its kind in Africa for three years in a row, excellence is not in dispute. UP Law academics are authors of authoritative textbooks and reference work, as well as multiple articles published in leading journals, and are actively involved in partnerships and collaborations with institutions and organizations across the globe. Our law students are highly sought after graduates. Law is a constantly developing field, and in addition to covering aspects of international law and law in Africa, the faculty also houses specialized research centers. UP Law follows an inquiry-led approach to teaching and research skills are highly valued. You will be guided in developing your knowledge base, critical and analytical thinking abilities, mental agility, ethical conduct and leadership skills. National and international moot court competitions will develop your advocacy skills, while our vibrant student life will build friendships and networks for your career and life. Final year students gain invaluable practical experience by assisting actual clients of the Law Clinic while also fulfilling their social responsibilities. As an alumnus, you will be well-grounded academically, well-rounded as an individual, and highly sought after as an employee and practitioner. The facts are before you, so what is your verdict? So we're coming live from Future Africa campus at the University of Pretoria. My name is uh, Dr. Joel Mudiri from the Department of Jurisprudence, Faculty of Law, University of Pretoria, and we welcome you, our virtual viewers, to this uh, really exciting discussion with the uh, Deputy Chief Justice Emeritus, Dikhang Moseneke. Uh, we'll be talking about his new book, All Rise. So I'll just hand over to my uh, boss, the Vice Chancellor, Professor Tawana Kupe, to um, start the proceedings. Prof. Thank you, T Professor Joel Modiri. I think you skipped one boss, <laughs> the I, dean. I, 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 I did not escalate properly. I'm going to start with <laughs> my other boss right next to me, the dean, Professor Asabi Skuman, uh, to start the proceedings. Thank you. Um, I think I'm going to uh, call on my deputy dean first to give us a welcome. So, uh, Professor Maimela, please, if you could welcome everybody to the proceedings. Thank you. Dumelang, Tawela. Good afternoon. Da. We welcome you at the University of Pretoria in the Faculty of Law. Today we are delighted as a faculty to be hosting the Legal Eagle himself all the way from Matrijville. And today it's a special event for us as a faculty to be interacting with our homeboy. We're welcoming home in the Faculty of Law. So as a faculty, we're here to engage with him robustly on his second memoir, called All Rise. He's challenging all of us, young and old, to rise above all expectations and to make a South Africa a better society for all of us. We are to learn extensively from this great giant because we are surely, surely, surely being challenged by this great legal mind in our midst. We learned greatly from his first memo titled My Own Liberator because all of us, we are called to liberate the little corners we find ourselves in. So as a faculty, we are very much delighted and happy to be in the midst and presence of the former Deputy Chief Justice Ndate Bikang Moseneke. I would like now to call upon the Executive Dean, Professor Elsa Biskuman, to do the introductions of the Vice Chancellor as well as the former Deputy Chief Justice Ndate Bikang Moseneke. Professor Skuman. Thank you, Professor Maimela. I would like to briefly um, introduce the principal and the vice chancellor of the University of Pretoria, Professor Tawana Kupe. Uh, Professor Kupe holds a BA honors degree and a master's in English from the University of Zimbabwe, as well as a DPhil in media studies from the University of Oslo in Norway. And in December last year, he was awarded an honorary doctorate in humanities 
by the Michigan State University. Welcome, Professor Kupe. I would also like to welcome our moderator um, today, um, Dr. Joel Mudiri. Um, he is a senior lecturer in the Department of Jurisprudence in the Faculty of Law. He holds the degrees um, LLB and PhD from the University of Pretoria, and his PhD thesis was titled The Jurisprudence of Steve Biko, a study in race, law and power in the afterlife of colonial apartheid. I would now like to call on the VC, Professor Kupi, to introduce um, Justice Moseneke. Good afternoon to all our audiences and a very warm welcome for my Deputy Chief Justice Dihang Moseneke. Today is the first time I got it right because I normally just call him the Deputy Chief Justice <laughs> and no offense to Judge Zondo. <laughs> <laughs> the Deputy Chief Justice is an illustrious uh, uh, CV and is very well known. So I will only uh, introduce him in summary. And I must also say that I've had the chance over the last 10 years to introduce him so many times. He always warned me about going on. <laughs> but I, I promise you I won't. As you know, uh, uh, the former Deputy Chief Justice, um, or De Chief Deputy Chief Justice Emeritus, as uh, Prof. Maimela called him, was at the age of 15 when he was in Standard 8, arrested, detained, and convicted of participating in anti apartheid activity. Sentenced to 10 years on, Ro on Robben Island, that did not deter him. He earned a number of degrees while in jail, all of them conferred by the University of South Africa. So, a BA in English and Political Science. B. Juris Degree, LLB. He's married to Cabo and they have a daughter and a son. He has he led an illustrious career in the, in, the, in the legal field, beginning as an attorney's clerk and rising all the way to becoming the Deputy Chief uh, Justice of the Republic of South Africa in, 2000, in June 2005 and retired in May 2016. Before then, he was a High Court Judge and a Constitutional Court Judge. Between 1995 and 2008, again an illustrious career in the corporate sector where he took time off from the bar as a chief executive, chairman of boards, a director and non-executive director across many sectors and industry in our society. You, you will also remember that he is a founder member of the Black Lawyer Association, the National Association of Democratic Lawyers. He has taught at Columbia Law School, also been integrally involved in contributing to our communities as chairperson of Project Literacy for 10 years, trustee of Soweto National Nation Building, deputy chair of the Nelson Mandela Children's Fund. He holds several honorary doctorates, I think, or nearly seven from what I can see here, from universities across South Africa, the U.S., including the University of Pretoria. He has also delivered many prestigious lectures, papers at various uh, uh, congresses, and also in, in honoring other, uh, other justices, including a tribute to former Chief Justice uh, Langa. He has also published, uh, some of his speeches and his talks have been published in law journals. Finally, Justice Moseneke is the author of two best-selling books, My Own Liberator, and Now All Rise, which reached the number one non-fiction seller in South Africa in a week. Welcome, Deputy Chief Justice Emeritus. So we're going to get right into it. Um, I just want to remind our viewers uh, who are watching us from everywhere that um, you can interact with us on social media using the hashtag, hashtag UPLaw. All rise. You can interact with us on Twitter, on Facebook, and of course also on Instagram. But Twitter is the main medium. You can send us questions, responses, and reactions, which we'll be more than happy to share with the Deputy Chief Justice Emeritus. We're going to have some discussion from questions we've already received from students and uh, members of the public. Uh, but before that, I think it's important to say that it's an enormous and, and singular honor to be in discussion with the, the Deputy Chief Justice on his second book, um, it's a judicial memoir that chronicles an extraordinary journey and career uh, at the nation's highest court and in the making of the nation's highest law. Now, it's become a bit of a cliche to refer to the DCJ emeritus as the chief justice we deserve but never had. <coughs> I'm not really sure that this is the right way to think about him since it defines him as what he is not, but he is many other things. 
a servant of the people, a campaigner for justice, a struggle hero, a Robin Islander, an Attridgeville native like me, a constitutional lawyer, an intellectual and a writer, a businessman, what he keeps describing as an enemy of racism and inequality, a humanitarian with a deep love for education, a husband and a family man, and most importantly, a failed Metro Police officer. <laughs> so uh, all of these uh, things that in this book all rise, um, which runs into nearly 400 pages as a testament uh, to the former Deputy Chief Justice status as a legal giant, really, but also as a really elegant writer and a thoughtful storyteller. Reading this book is quite thrilling, quite exciting, um, more than simply informative. Um, and so this book is really a certifiable must read, as is the previous book that's been mentioned, My Own Liberator. And so with that, uh, an obvious caveat that in the short hour that we have with the Deputy Chief Justice, or former Deputy Chief Justice, we can really only get a taste of his ideas and reflections that he captures in the book and which speak to our present context. Um, the Deputy Chief Justice lives in Pretoria. Uh, I have already uh, requested that since he does not live too far from campus that we can count on having further conversations. So to kick off, I'm going to ask the questions that's normally asked last. I'm going to ask it first. Uh, to the Chief Justice. Uh, welcome again, uh, former Deputy Chief Justice. So something that you mentioned in the book, um, you say more about it in the previous book, but in this one, it's sort of in passing, um, is your fascinating entry into politics. And as a young teenager who joins the Pan-Africanist Congress of Azania, and we know that Etridgeville is a central site for the ferment of the Pan-Africanist Congress in that period, 1963. In 1963, with your fellow comrades of the Azanian movement, you are charged with conspiracy to overthrow the apartheid regime, uh, and then you're imprisoned for 10 years. And then the book takes us through your experience um, in law practice, how this political struggle leads you into law practice, including the political trials of the 1980s, which then anticipates your post-1994 entry into the judiciary, first as an acting judge, and then ultimately on the constitutional court. Then your role on the technical committee that drafted the 1993 constitution, which is a very important constitution because it laid the foundation for what some people call the final constitution, but we know it's not final. <laughs> <laughs> your high praise of the Chaskelson court, uh, as it's called, um, sometimes also called the Mandela court because it was the, the court that was uh, appointed by Nelson Mandela. And you talk about it as the golden age of rights jurisprudence. And finally, your own role in developing um, post-1994 constitutional jurisprudence um, in a transformative direction as the main principle. So this long history, it takes us nearly into half of the book. I'd, I'd like to ask you to retrace for us that long history by talking about the political ideals that drew you into the Pan-Africanist Congress, into the PAC, that idea of Azania, Pan-Africanism, black liberation, the forgotten figure of Robert Sobuko, who you also talk about in the previous book. And juxtapose this for us with your later significant role in championing um, a new constitutional democracy under an ANC government, um, what some would call a Western-style liberal democracy under an ANC government. Was there a shift? Was there a maturation? Was there a tension? Uh, if you could retrace that, those steps for us. Yes, Dr. <coughs> Mudiri, thank you. Uh, but let me go and do the usual, which I must. If you get into, it's very African. You get into a particular territory, you've got to start with the chiefs and the leaders and, and thank them yeah. for allowing you to be around there and to be useful in that area. And therefore, I'm going to go and start with you, VC and principal. Indeed, I have, we've known each other for quite some time mm. and it's wonderful to see you here and thank you for receiving me. Mm -hmm. um, you have introduced me many times, you're quite right. Uh, Professor Schumann, thank you. I drafted the letter to you tentatively saying, that's my alma mater, so you can't keep me out. <laughs> I'm coming and I'd like to debate all rise with, um, with the law school. Absolutely. And you very graciously said, it, of course it will happen. Uh, Professor Maimel, thank you for that warm, warm welcome. Indeed, it is, it is a Swali affair, very much an Archibald affair, and it is wonderful. And to Dr. Mudiri, he's from my, the neck of the woods. He, uh, I would have, my colleagues would have inspired him in many ways. You're right, Attridgeville <clears throat> in Swan, it was the epicenter of Africanist thinking. 
and it remains so in, in many significant ways. <clears throat> Those who don't know you yourself drew a lot of your inspiration, uh, your intellectual inspiration, jurisprudential inspiration from that upbringing. Mm. And it's uncomplicated actually, because our history converted the Pan-Africanist Congress into some specter, horrible specter that ought to be hated and avoided. And, and yet, no. And I make it in my own liberator, I explain at the beginning the fundamentals of Africanist thinking. First of those, of course, is to overthrow white domination and colonialism. It's uncomplicated. You're oppressed. You look around and see, look at the source of your oppression. Uh, and you set yourself collectively with others to overthrow it. So overturning and removing colonialism and apartheid was such an obvious call that you do, which other movements do. African National Congress does it sort of half-heartedly, <laughs> but essentially that is a call, Dr. Madiri, to a fundamental change and rearrangement of power relations in society. So its target is always fundamental in order to be able to achieve what? Not, not for its own sake, a just, open, non-racial, inclusive society. And it's Africanists, uh, ironically, I use the space just to explain that. It's Robert Mangal, it's a Sobuka who said, there's only one race, Professor Schumann, the human race. And our external differences are ephemeral, they are truly peripheral. At the core of it all, we all are human beings. And those human beings are the one who are worthy of freedom, freedom from colonialism. And that's why we should be anti-racist, because we want to be non-racial. And that is why we should actually move to a society where there would be justice. And land sits central to the, our notion of justice because we can come back to this some other time. Our current poverty in our land, which we choose to call Azania, is actually peri-urban. All the poor people sit around the rich enclaves of, of urban existence in our country. And look at them, they are landless. I said to somebody the other day, as a achlek, they sit in terrible circumstances, principally because they have no piece of land that they can claim to be their own. So it was fun, and, and colonialism did that. It was dispossession, and therefore it was essential to reassert the right to gain access to land again. So there are no mysteries about Pan-Africanism. There are no essential oddities. And then, of course, the one big part of it is to embrace all of Africa and all the people who live in it. It was Sobuka who said, we're not talking color, we're talking people of Africa who would embrace their Africanity mm. in their fullness, and then they become part of us. So I just thought I would clear that right up front. Was there any, you summarize that trajectory and journey very valuably, thank you very much. That's indeed what it is. And for that same reason, the book starts by saying to you, of course, the common law is a colonial imposition. It was common to the rulers, mm. never common to the ruled, never was. And it was common to the extent that how could it have been common when Muslim marriages were not marriages, mm. African traditional marriages were not, or Hindu marriages were not marriages, etc., etc. So in effect, it was common to only to the powered elite of the time who drove the power relations mm. in society. And I go on to explain in the book how apartheid was essentially uh, male-centric, white male-centric. Even white women did not make the cut. They started voting only in 1928. Mm. And when I go to the bench, I make the same point. There are two white women who were judges, and the rest of them were white males. So we had a toxic male-centric power arrangement that basically derives from the colonial setup and perpetuates itself into a new regime. 
So I, I know you have said before, you think there's a shift in my own position. We can explore that a little further. I don't think you can call it any more than an adaptation. Mm. You see, we'll debate that, Dr. Madiri, later. 1994, was not a known event, I think. When you plot the trajectory of our struggle and the history of our people, there'll be a big dot that will be 1994. And why? Because it was a point when political power was transferred. We can debate how substantive was that political power. But in effect, <clears throat> military power was transferred, policing power was transferred, control of the treasury was transferred. So decisions around, for instance, syllabuses and what is taught at school was notionally transferred. It could be decided at a point, different from the point in 19, before 1994. The debate we will have, and I hope we will have over time, is what did we do with that transition? If the debate is a complete revolution, of course it's easy. A complete revolution, you march with your guns on your shoulders and you whistle on your way, and then you establish a government from ground zero. That's one scenario. Mm. And our scenario was not like that. For many reasons that we might debate at some other time. So. For me, the important thing, and that changed my uh, decisions, my newer decisions, was we have what potentially could be a valid democratic arrangement, provided those who inherit power do the right things. And the decision I took, and in the book I tell you how I was hounded out to become a judge, and ultimately agree, I will become a judge. And I characterize the, the constitution, the transition in a particular way. And, and I think in my view, it is substantive in some of the many things that Africanist thinkers on the continent want, could and can be achieved, provided there's enough work that's been done around it. I'm going to stop there. I mean, there are many issues that we can talk about. But I dream of a time, as I say in the book, when every young man and woman in this land, whatever their hue, whatever their background, whatever their origin, and every young man and woman in, the, in Africa, you've seen that in my dedication, mm. will know when they're oppressed, will know when they're excluded. And we will, they will not tolerate that and that they would rise. Somewhere in the book, this or the other one, I complained about being invited to fight two revolutions in one lifetime. Mm. You must have seen that line. And whether it is fair, I was complaining, is it fair to, to go to war against systems <laughs> twice in one lifetime, <laughs> you know? So in short, I do think once we had established a potentially democratic arrangement in the country, we could have reversed the consequences of, of colonial repression, exclusion, and economic exploitation, provided you set up a competent state. Mm. And I thought we could protect that process by having an effective judiciary that is true to the broader aims and objectives of, that, that we set out, that we set out in the, in the Constitution. Mm. I think I'm going to stop there, so yes. we can have a debate and not a sermon. Yeah. 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 Well, it's fortuitous that we're having this discussion, of course, on our, our brand new Future Africa campus, which intends uh, to be a, a place for knowledge, Pan-Africanist knowledge development mm. and Pan-Africanist community building. I think where we agree is that the transfer of political power in the early 90s 
has not translated into a substantive transfer of social, economic, cultural power. You can transfer the power, but if these institutions and value systems are still of the old order, then you have the situation which we've seen all over the continent, a neo-colonial arrangement, right? The new elite simply takes over and continues. And we're going to get to the discussion around life as many and other instances that show that we, we have that um, kind of arrangement. So another thing about this book, which uh, makes it very important, and you've already preempted some of my questions, but is that it, it, it not only chronicles your life and career in one way, but it, it tells a story of a society still in transition in many ways, politically, legally, institutionally. And the kind of political and jurisprudential work that is required to realize the basic aspirations of freedom, equality, dignity. Right, those kinds of ideals. Now, so you speak early on in the book about, uh, you use the phrase uh, fresh optimism uh, when uh, uh, the early 90s arrived. You speak of possibilities and you speak of hope. By the end of the book, that optimism has eroded in some way, in part because of what you describe as a kind of crisis of leadership across um, the, the spectrum, but also a crisis of political will, um, including political scandals, the failed promises of the new order. But something else is eroding that fresh optimism, and that is something I would think of as the loss of faith in the constitutional project. You often say it's only young people who've lost faith in it, but I don't think so. I think even some older people are starting to realize that we might need to think and re-engineer a new democratic project, uh, which might include amending or, and rethinking our, our current constitutional framework. There are two critiques that I, I don't expect you to respond to them directly because you do so in the book, but I want to put them to you because uh, um, you've, you've asked us to do so. Sure. The first one about the Constitution is the one we all know. It's the unrealized promises. It's the fact that the, the, the grand vision of a transformed, egalitarian, humane society has for a whole host of reasons not been realized. And that the black majority continues to experience this an empty or hollow freedom, right? Freedom in name only, formal freedom. Um, that's on the one hand, but there's a deeper philosophical critique which comes out of the Africanist tradition, comes out of the black consciousness and PAC tradition, which is very important. And some of us are doing work to bring that tradition back into jurisprudence. And yes. it's causing a lot of people's headaches, rightly so. And that is that the Constitution, as it currently stands, would be incapable of fully dismantling the power relations and structures created by colonial conquest and its afterlife. That the South African state, the whole idea of South Africa, the way it was arranged spatially, economically, culturally, was created not only without, but against the African. Right? And then perpetuates continual cultural and economic violence against its black majority. So that there's something about the constitutional framework itself, the language it uses, the vision it espouses, the origins of its emergence, that is part of this failure in transformation. And that the constitutional framework, and that, so not just the text, but also the, 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 the jurisprudence, the writing, the scholarship around it, lacks a robust mandate for serious wealth distribution, lacks a a, a robust framework for reparation, for real serious reparation. You talk about Azapo, the Azapo decision, which is a very crucial decision um, that we teach our first years. And the question of responsibility for perpetrators and beneficiaries of colonial apartheid. That the constitution is too silent on those questions, or the way we've been thinking about the constitution hasn't amplified that. Your book says, and in your interviews, you say the constitution has been partly successful. Talk to us in light of the critiques I've just yes. slightly elaborated. I really would like to do that. I'd like to join the debate. Um, um, and it's one that I'd hope it will come up, and it is right here. Let's, let's deal with it. Um, let's start with the first part. The Constitution has failed, has led to a deferred dream. True. But let's not make a category error that is well known in philosophy where you have mixed trajectories and mixed metaphors around our thinking. It's a little like somebody who reads the Bible and still do a lot of horrible things. Mm. Now to smash 
I'm not using the Bible for any reason. It could be the Quran, it could be the Gita, it could be, it could be any, any, any manuscript that, that tries to prescribe how to live. You don't throw it into the fire because he's continued to be, if you like, a bastard. <laughs> he kills, he maims, he rapes, he, he gets drunk, he does all the horrible things. So we make a category mistake every time we think the unfortunate the deferred dream is because the constitution in itself is bad, which is the second part, which I'll come to in a moment. Let's start with the first part. Let's think, let's, let's imagine for a moment. You said the constitution is arrived at without African people's participation. People in the NC would debate with you about that. They were there and they negotiated it, they put it together. And they would, and I know you, 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 your view is different, but they would say, well, we were there. Mm. We, we cut this deal. L let me suggest this to you. You see, I, I think if we had brought energy and vision and honesty and fidelity to the ideals that ultimately were encrusted, this would be a different neighborhood. This would be a place where people would have been cut had pieces of land vast with infrastructure, connection to water and sewage, and they'd be flourishing and building their own homes. Mm. This would have been a place where we could have sent 200,000, 100,000 young people, some to Brazil to go and learn how to produce maize. Nothing in the constitution could have stood in the way of that. This is a place where we could have sent 8,000 people to go and learn how to produce flowers and export them to the world. This is a place where we could have sent another half a million to China to learn to be engineers and come back and we pro production goes to Israel. What I'm saying is the obvious incompetence that the state is displaying cannot be smashed or squabbed into one place with the high ideals of our constitution. Mm. It means to create a democratic space that is free, that is open, that is non-racial, that is non-sexist, that would give people access to the most basic goods that they need, access to healthcare, to water, to, to schooling, to education, to, and no constitution in the world goes that far, none. So, that DNA is not, even a, is not even a Western liberal DNA to our constitution. It's openly and plainly transformative. It was intended to represent some of the highest ideals that our liberation struggle stood by. Mm. If you asked Ban to Steve Biko and said, what are the things that would have constituted a just society? or ask Robert Mangalisa Sobuk, or ask Oliver Tambo. The answers will not be too far from each other, having set up the history. So just on the first part, I want to say a lethargic, a lazy, an incompetent, uninspired state that never lifted its eyes to look at the high ideals mm that our struggle imposed on us. We know those ideals, Dr. Madir. There are certain ideals imposed on us by a long, long struggle. And, and those ideals, many of them were translated into wording that you find in the Constitution. Not all of them, but many of them. We can go to section 25. But let me tell you where I said, you know, I wrote a paper which is published, which is debated often, about how much you could have done under section 25. Mm. I'm not opposed to, to it being amended, amended, amended the way you do, but so much more could have been. Look at the restitution process. It has been stalled completely. I mean, the waiting lists, VC of 25 years, mm. whose claims have not been honored. I mean, getting water to villages. Mm. I mean, so what I'm saying is at a practical level, if I had anything to do with it, and I'm chosen to become a judge and therefore passive, and hear complaints about all these things, I would have been out to a village and say, let me help you build a dam. And every village would have had a dam in this country. We'd have farrows to where they plant. We'd have been given each 
10 head of cattle or money for it to start their own breeding. So I'm saying there are things that we could have done under the constitution with an active and competent and truly democratic state. Mm -hmm. We made errors in the architecture and we can't go and talk about that. The architecture of the constitution, the proportional representation, installing the party as the be all at the end all of our lives. These are errors and they are real errors, mm -hmm. but the errors don't include the fact that there was no true idealism to transform society. Let me get to the second point. Philosophically, as I get older, I come to know that you can't will a new society on paper. Mm. You, can't, you, can't, you, can't, you can't will social and economic equality on paper. The Constitution can't do it. People who wield and exercise power in society can do it. If we would, I mean, think about the things I've said, and I don't want to repeat them again. We could have truly empowered so, so many young people. Despite our colonial past, we could have taken so many young people to all over the world when, during the honeymoon period I write about in the book, and ask them to train our people on how to do just about anything. And would have been a real true uh, <clears throat> destination. And I refuse to look at the solution only in one direction a concentration of small white people who, who, who ups and them, our world is going to become wonderful. I think the truth is if many, many of us get energized and given the opportunity, then we can, we can, create, we can create far more wealth than another clique of white South Africans have created in this country. That's my true, honest belief that we, we actually can. Mm. And hence the need all of us to rise, to try and rearrange and reconfigure 94. Um, and if you ask me, the constitutionalist, I wouldn't say the first era is the constitution. I would say the first era are people. The first era may be the Chatteris tradition. The first era is lack of energy and commitment to actually improving the lives of our people. Mm. Some of it you can't, you, can't, you can't explain it in rational jurisprudential terms. How on earth do you steal money that has to go and supply water? Mm. And then you sell the water. Mm. Now those things defy the narrow strictures of, of constitutional and jurisprudential uh, de de defects. Uh, we could have done better. And Tate Mandela was aware of this criticism. And as you know, I've spent quite a bit of time talking to him and listening to him. Mm. Uh, uh, and he says, his answer is short. He says, I've given you the keys, the keys of possibilities. You had the military mind, you have the coercion of the state, you had the treasury, you had the power to make laws, you had the majority to change things around. And what you had to do was, was to do it. Mm. Let me leave it there. Okay. So I see uh, already that uh, we're getting questions from viewers uh, that want to get into the nitty gritty of your um, judicial career and um, <laughs> uh, the, the question you've probably been asked over and over again. I'm going to phrase the question slightly differently. Um, at some point, and that's why I described part of your book as a thriller, yes. you start talking <laughs> about the storm brewing. <laughs> and, 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 and you start talking about the end of the honeymoon period for the judiciary and for the political space in South Africa when, when things um, begin to change. And so your own, it starts with this moment, uh, 2005, the removal of Jacob Zuma as deputy president by, by Tabombeki. 
that's really the end of the honeymoon. That's when yeah. we see a radical politicization of the judiciary, of law enforcement. We see political interference becoming the norm, secret meetings, late night meetings, and so forth. Um, then there's the recall of President Beggy. Then there's the, your lavish 60th birthday. Yes. <laughs> and, and, and what you call um, your mantra of judicial ethics. So you called it the judicial mantra, where you say at, at this birthday party, it is not what the ruling party wants, it's what is good for the people that matters. And of course, as you know, this you know, precipitates a long process that would, that would lead to um, you know, the, what many people consider the denial uh, of, of, of uh, your rightly deserving Chief Justice position. Then there is the, 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 the more scandalous matter of the um, JP Thrope, uh visiting the chambers of two of your colleagues, um, resulting in a long, unresolved, still unresolved JSC battle. You're one of the few people who can still be a witness if this <laughs> matter comes up. You know that it has obviously escalated into a kind of Hollywood story, you know, the <laughs> assassinations and so forth. And then there's the appointment of CJ Mohueng and the need and the, the difficult relationship you had to form, which ultimately becomes a fruitful relationship in resisting the encroachments of state power. Yes. So. The one question is, of course, you can tell us a little bit about um, that moment when you, 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 you realize, and you talk about three times, you, see, you, you were denied chief justiceship three times, actually. For, 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 for your career and for your judicial career, what that meant, you talk about it here, but you can share with us. But I'm actually interested in what those experiences, the Shope Meta, the Mohueng appointment, um, the, the, your interactions with the ANC after, after your 60th birthday, what that taught you about the, 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 the appropriate values, disposition, conduct of a judge? Uh, what, what does it mean to be a judge in a stormy, contested political context? What, you know, if, if someone was, yeah, and, I, and I think this would, would, would be valuable for lawyers, for law students as well. What, in those times of crisis, what, characteristics or a judge to represent in the, those moments? Sure. <clears throat> yes, the book shows you that it was transition, it was stormy, mm. and there was no obvious correct side. Um, <clears throat> and contest for state power had become real. And at my 60th birthday, I, I, I was basically trying to restate what I thought was the obvious. Mm. But within a stormy and highly contested time and terrain, uh, and therefore people think this is not what a judge should be saying, this is not what judges should, should do and say, mm. and uh, has he taken sides? And he's probably taken Becky's side against Jacob Zuma's side, this kind of thing. And of course, I'm at pains to explain to us none of all that. Mm. And that if, if I had to take any sides, I probably would take Jacob Zuma's side, but there were no sides to take. Mm. So one, the one thing is, that's not a place for sissies, I make the point. <laughs> okay, <laughs> if you want to be a judge, <laughs> it's a little like yeah. if you want to be a referee in a rugby match, yeah. okay? Yeah. You, 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 it's not a place for sissies, you know? Mm -hmm. And if you have blown for a penalty, you have blown for it. Mm -hmm. It's not even a place for sissies, even in a soccer match, mm -hmm. where there's less violence, I think. Mm -hmm. You know, less, less physicality, I should say. And when judges do blow, I say to young people, half the stadium is unhappy. At least half. Mm -hmm. when, when, when I cheer for sundowns, as you know, I'm from Pretoria. Mm -hmm. You know, I openly cheer for sundowns. And every time sundowns wins, we rarely get penalties at sundowns, but, but when the referee gives, it would be sure to be pilloried half the field of blue bulls, I support blue bulls. I'm from Pretoria and I go to Olofters and support them. So the essence of my point was, and it remains to be so, we need judges who would have a full appreciation that they are going to be tackled from time to time. Legitimately, by academics, mm -hmm on pen and paper, or on a screen, very gently, that is fine. And that, that ought to happen, but also illegitimately. And I go into the book to show you how I was dubbed a CIA spy. Hello, 
<laughs> the good staunch African is that I am all my life. <laughs> you know, I love our land and all its people and all people of Africa with all my might, you know. I'm as Pan-Africanist as they come, and I'm a CIA spy. <laughs> and, and so I said, Jacob Zuma, prove it. Mm -hmm. That's why in the book I show you that I wrote to him with Johan van der Westeisen and, uh, and, 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 and my other colleague. And we write a letter to him and say, OK, show us you know, the, the CIA thing stuff. Obviously, they can't find any evidence. And, <laughs> and just as Johan van der Westeisen says, well, can I get the account number <laughs> so I can go to Cayman Island and get the dollars? <laughs> I've been a public servant all my life, so I need the dollars if, if I've been paid by the CIA. Now, it was calling out power elite that has gone gaga mm. against the judiciary. Mm. And what Shope was doing, JJP Shope, was in, more or less in that genre coming in and telling judges possibly how they should decide a matter. And again, um, when Justice Mohuen came in there, uh, the most junior amongst all of us, and, and there was that concern about what's happening. Mm -hmm. So there will be judges should know that when we talk about executive power and legislative power, there will be contestations. And I knew and understood my duty. My duty was to or to basically come behind Chief Justice Mukwege as he was then, to buttress him and encourage him to serve the larger interest, which is that of the people, my mantra. To, to, and, and, and we made common cause on that basis. And it was the only basis we could make common cause, that we're not serving the interest of a narrow ruling clique that was less than faithful even to the modicum of ideals that we find in a constitution, mm -hmm. whatever one's views were. So in many ways, it was a triumphant outcome when it was intended to be a debilitating outcome. And, um, and we remain decent friends with the Chief Justice Mohueng, whose term ends next year. Mm -hmm. And the process must start all over again to look for a new supremo. And I can see articles already popping up to say, <laughs> how should a good chief justice look like? You know what I mean? <laughs> so our nation, I think our nation needs, whichever way view wants to take jurisprudential or otherwise, our nation needs referees, good robust referees, who can blow against the blue bulls or blow against sharks and not get a blue eye. And if they get a blue eye to survive the blue eye, and, and I think I, I tell that story also in the book. We need good institutions. And, and, and that's why I invite Minister Khadebe to say what happened to the institutions under his watch. Mm. Uh, we tried, I tried, I thought it was important to have a good, robust, efficient, thoughtful, and faithful judiciary. And I think that's probably the transformative route that you say I took. But that became my key position to say this is a vital part of transforming us or changing our society mm. to produce good jurisprudence through a good judiciary. So I see Mashudu, um, who's reached out to us via our hashtag UP Law or Rise, um, engaging with us on social media, is very interested in the matter of Shope. But I invite you to turn to the book where um, the, mm. the Deputy Chief Justice is very clear about his position on the, the, the delay of the JSC on acting on matters of judicial, judicial misconduct. Um, it feels very much like we've just started, but we're actually near the end. Um, I have two questions, but I'll start with the first one because I also want to put my bosses on the spot. And it has to do with what I think is really my favorite chapter in the book. There are many, but it's the one uh, that you titled Choosing Law, Why You Chose the Law. And in that chapter, you recall what you call the stridently Eurocentric character of the courses that you did in the LLB and the colonial imposition of the Roman Dutch law, the English law, uh, which was, of course, imposed, imposed by the two conquering powers in South Africa. And you say that the law schools and the courts were blind to what was glaringly obvious, namely that the common law was a colonial imposition on an indigenous people. 
But then you also talk about your experience as a, a judge in the high court and the manner in the hierarchy uh, that you experienced when you, when you arrived there. So from there you also practice law. So you've seen all the different dimension of, of, of law. But for those of us who are teachers and those of us who are running uh, the, the in undisputably top law school in, uh, in the continent, <laughs> um, what is your view on the current state of legal education? You've seen many lawyers and law graduates come before you as clerks, arguments before you, you've interacted with many. Um, you make this observation as a law student, stridently Eurocentric. What, what is your sense now of legal education in South African law schools and legal ethics in, 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 the, in the profession today? And then I'm going to ask the, the, the deputy dean and the dean to also tell us what they are doing <laughs> to, <laughs> to unpack the stridently Eurocentric character and of the LLB. Really <laughs> <laughs> and even the VC. It would be, be, be wonderful <laughs> to hear that. Look, um, I don't think you could do much about, I suppose, in some ways, maths and science, which have a universal kind of you know, lexicon and language and so on and understand that. When you deal with something close to the human condition as law, you have to take in uh, its formative features, how it has come into being. But more importantly, the purpose that is meant to serve. So it is important just to tell my colleagues, to tell law professors, to tell young people and say, let's not forget how we came to where we are. We were a conquered people, and there was an imposition of what law would, would, would write and would work. And if it wasn't law, it meant that it didn't matter. And that's why our marriages didn't matter, or what, you know, everything else that we did didn't matter, because you, you keep it out, you keep it out of there. Uh, the quest of women for equality, for instance, so it didn't matter under parliamentary sovereignty and, and positivism. The parliament decided, and that was the end of the role. So um, it, it, it is quite, it is quite important for me to be able to make that statement at the end of all this and say, damn, I had to do Latin one, Africa's the other is one, I had to do English one for LLB. It was a prerequisite, not even part of the entire limb. And I say the penny dropped, of course, because I had to study foreign law and I can access it only through foreign language. So it made sense to me that you have to, if you impose your legal system, you must impose your languages. And in that way, the circle is, is complete. And I revert back to say, I opted, I understood this, I saw it when I was on Robben Island with my Africanist training, but understood that in order to overcome this, I actually had to, to do it and pass it and get, get behind it, and then come and review it at my own time. It translated to a resistant legal culture later, as I show in the book. Because then, many law professors, many judges, many refused to acknowledge that, in fact, the common law was an imposition. Mm. In fact, they believe it is the start, the start, the alpha and the omega of legal training. And I say, that is an interesting curiosity for legal history. But when you look at any rule of law, whatever its origin, whether indigenous law, Professor Maimela, or it is, it is a common law, one must acknowledge its history, how it had come there. And one must then measure it against the values that we have introduced in the Constitution. Uh, which is the most recent, I think, account of sort of our common convictions. Mm. It's a bare minimum of our common convictions are written down. There they are there. So you can't seek, and that's why Arthur Chaskelson in pharmaceutical said there's only one law in this place. You don't have administrative law under the common law and administrative law under the constitution. This is one neighborhood. So we're in the same place here. It is quite important because you had people, up to now you do have law professors, who think the only way to teach is to go and look at food and von Vermelo and, and nothing else and you must go out there and that's the only thing that works and that's only authority. This was 1600 Europe, 150 years ago. 
it's an interesting historical curiosity, as I say, but immediately you say, what is just? Are there just outcomes that come out of this? And how consistent is this? And the Constitution says so, it demands that itself. It's got a transformative role. Mm -hmm. Similarly, indigenous law, you can't say to me only young men can inherit from their father or mother. It's crazy. Male primogenitor in indigenous law. And that's why we struck it down. Okay? It might have worked some time ago, but present day young women should inherit so they don't stay poor all the time and get exploited by men. So, we must always test it against, I think, that lead motif if we are to make progress in our society. Common law, the Constitution has given it new oxygen, but only to the extent that it is consistent with the larger values that we have introduced. And I think law schools should do that. Mm. And many law schools don't. So I'm going to ask, we're going to go just around and get some responses to uh, the DCJ. How far are we in transforming the curricula? I'll start with you, Dean. Yes, thank you. <laughs> so, only having been in office for a little while. <laughs> <laughs> but teaching for but many years. Yes, <laughs> teaching for many years. And, of course, being a woman, I've got to ask you this. Yes. Um, the role of women in law, and you've written about that in your book, and it also relates to the title of the book, I believe. Mm. So, if mm. you could perhaps... Um, engage us on that or we can engage you and definitely Dr. Muderi we will engage um, Justice Moseneke more mm -hmm. in the law school mm -hmm. if if he is available but mm -hmm. if you could just briefly um, tell us about that and how we should go about that the role of women yes because we're running out of time I'll ask yeah. Professor Maimela to also jump in and you can perhaps respond Combine to everybody I don't know if the VC also wants yes. to add um, yes. I would like just to also ask because you were uh, discussing the aspect of indigenous law in particular, what advice would you give, particularly in relation to indigenous law, because it's still underdeveloped, even though it's fully recognized legal system, what advice would you give to us, particularly as we enter into an arena where curriculum transformation is on the table? What role do you view indigenous law playing in relation to the, the curriculum of the LLB going to the future? Thank you. Mm. Principal, are you going to speak now or you want to speak later? <laughs> okay, so my, my, I think I'll be very brief. Mm. My position at the University of Pretoria is that one of the things that has harmed academia generally, not just the teaching of law, mm. is the siloizations of disciplines. Mm. And that you cannot teach law outside the context of philosophy, politics, sociology which in themselves should be transformed. Absolutely. So our route in the University of Pretoria is going to be what I call a transdisciplinary approach, but people must be competent in the subject that they learn. Yes, <laughs> yes. entirely, that is fascinating. In fact, I've just come back from Duke where I taught the first four months of this year mm -hmm. and I ran away because of Corona. Mm -hmm. yeah. When Trump said, it's, no, it's just a, a serious <laughs> <laughs> flu, yeah. then I thought, no, I want to have the flu at home, not here. Yeah. <laughs> but but um, and, and, and they've been battling silos and throwing them out. Mm. And the classes that I taught in LLM had infusion of just about everything that around us. Okay. Mm. Uh, but let's, let me go back to, to the point. Let me start with indigenous law. You see... Again, you learn as you grow that nothing is static. Mm -hmm. Nothing stays pristine forever. Indigenous law is under attack, has been under attack ever since the colonial incursion. And was stunted. Where it was documented, think about the Zulu code, it was fudged. It's a patriarchal, unequal, horrible manifestation of of what our law should be. Mm. Women are just almost wiped out of the scene like they never existed and so mm. on. And it really fudges the important roles that, for instance, women had in traditional arrangements. So we raising indigenous law is, and then the first urbanization that we see, you're going to struggle to actually steady, steady the custom and the practice of indigenous law currently. Some remain important around, for instance, birth of children, around marriage, around, they're valuable. 
and should be systematized and kept and respected. Um, but there are certain things that can survive. And I think law schools should take it upon themselves to try and understand which parts are still valuable, which are not. Mm. In order, I mean, our biggest task currently is destruction of things which are quite obvious. I don't want to talk about triple burden because they've trivialized that so, so terribly. But the things that us and African continent should be battling with, and, 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 and customary law should not be left out of that. It should, it should be part of that larger debate on how we can influence values in, 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 in crusting a new, new way of, of thinking. Common law, pretty much the same thing. If you can look at a judgment I wrote on Van der it basically excluded women from being able to recover damages from their partners in certain circumstances. And I wrote that judgment, and I felt quite strongly that the common law was, must be called out. No. Because remember, up until the 1970s, for instance, under common law, a, a man could not rape his wife. She was deemed to have granted perpetual consent. So it's not like we're dealing with some holy, perfect cow from Europe in the 1600s. We're dealing with, it reflects the power relations in Europe at the time. There are notions of ownership of land, the notion of ownership, for instance, you have to have said, I'm owner, and the rest shall be given unto you. The rest must be evicted, they must go running for dear life. Now, that was what happening during feudal systems. And these laws developed during the feudal system. So women were out, were right out there. I mean, you know, the, the administrator of the joint estate was deemed to be a man under the common law. And uh, if people chose sexual partners were different, it was an offense under the common law. You were hung on the nearest tree, okay? So our constitution reforms both the systems. It's very important not to be coy about this and put history into it. And law schools should be saying, as Justice Ishmael Muhammad once said, we close the, firm, the door firmly on what is bad in our past and let in only what is good for the present. And law schools should be doing that much more actively. But some law schools have been to, I'm honorary professor at many places except, of course, this, this university. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and I go and teach occasional lectures there, Dr. Madiri. And <clears throat> I'm trying to make this point that we're at a new space. You can't at once want to embrace the Constitution and the benefits it brings you if you are sort of in the, in the power class in this country. But refuse and want to apply Roman Dutch law, Roman Dutch law only, for better, for worse, whatever the Constitution says. There is, it's retrogressive. Mm. It's counter-revolutionary. That's a real counter, not montages. That's counter yeah, that's a real counter-revolutionary. We're technically out of time. I'm going to ask the people behind the screen how much more time, liberty-wise, we can use up. We've got about five minutes to, well, we've got about seven minutes to, to wrap up. And um, I hope the dean will be leading the campaign for a woman chief justice, <laughs> since you know that there's a vacancy that's upcoming. <laughs> you are the first woman dean of our faculty, and so you need a, a, a fellow in the judiciary. Yes, you, can, yes. you can work with a sister in the judiciary. We, we've talked about a lot of things, and the, the, the deputy chief justice has taken us through a, a wide range of issues, but the, the common theme is um, the question that should be on all our minds, and that's the question of, um, in a way, where to next? The book um, ends with um, one of the major tragic episodes in South African history. One, one might say is the Marikana massacre because of the sheer cruelty of that episode. Mm -hmm. But the next one um, is, is the one in which you then presided over in your post-judicial career. Um, and um, uh, former head of the Department of Jurisprudence, Johan van Evestes, will tell you, of course, that judges actually never retire. So it's, a, it's actually <laughs> a, a weird phrase. You, you just <laughs> transition into a new <laughs> judicial space. <laughs> but you are involved in the life estimation hearings. And um, 
what you capture in the book is less the sort of legal, delictual damages, compensation issues, the technical legal problem. But you keep taking us back to the human element. The, 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 the uh, um, 114 lives lost, more than 1,400 lives traumatized and, 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 and devastated. Um, simply because of neglect, just systemic ongoing neglect which borders on absolute cruelty, bound up with the problem of corruption, the misuse of resources. Um, and, and what you kept talking about is a, a, a governing party and a governing order that neither has the imagination or the ethics <laughs> for humane government. Um, can you tell us, in as many words as you can, what, the, what that experience meant for you at the end of your judicial career, having fought for justice for so many years, to encounter that kind of neglect of, of human lives, that kind of devastation? Um, and some thoughts on a way forward, because we're going to wrap up very sure. soon. Sure. You know, <clears throat> more people died in the life of Sidmeli situation than Sharpville and Marikana put together. Mm. Both were horrific yes. times in our history. Mm. Sharpville was terrible. Um, so was Marikana. And in between there were always smaller incidences of brutality. Mm. Uh, but that stood out because it was after we had made all these vows, if you like. You know how much time we take, they call us judges to swear in ministers and it's big fanfare and you all see it on television and, uh, and be faithful to the Republic of South Africa, so help me God. Those are always the last words. And I ran into this thing at the end of my career where I think I'd thrown every punch I had in the book. Every punch I threw from when I was 15. Mm. And I said, Hofmeyer High School, and I hated apartheid, and joined the pan Africanist Congress of Azania then when I was young. And then I ran into this horrific thing. And I can't get sensible explanations. If you like, for some people who are supposed to be my comrades, but I can't get anything that tells me why these people had to die. Mm. It was during election time. There are all sorts of rumors about what happened to the 300 million. It was local government election, one of the most um, you know, heated ones. And they're thrown out, the money's not used in that direction. And remember how, what effort I took to call people like Barbara Chris, he was MEC for finance and others, to come and say, what happened to the money? Where's the money? Where, where did you use it for? Where did it go to? I had an uncomfortable hunch. Were we sacrificing vulnerable people for continued grasp of power? I mean, was this refunneled in some ways that I couldn't find the evidence that establishes that? But the evidence of inhumanity was incredible. It was, for once, the notion of, for once I thought the revolution had failed. That's a difficult admission for somebody like me to make, who has lived only for that. It can be that we are here where we are. Because really, my, wife, my life is a resume of all this, just being totally absorbed and consumed by having a more humane and just society. Mm. And here it is now, it is horrifically, just as horrible as our past. So it was, at that level, it was one of the worst things. But I mean, I'll stop in a moment, I know time is running out, but think about the horror of looking at an album of decomposed corpses. Mm. Let's take a step back, why? Because the hospitals, mortuaries where the corpses were kept, many people were taken over, they died and the 
families did not know where they were. So they had to be kept somewhere and they kept in government mortuaries in all sorts of places where they were taken to. Okay? The procurement people there did not buy the gas that you need to keep the mortuaries at a certain coolness level. You check, and I even called those people, if you remember, I called them to come and tell me, mm. why, who was it, who, why did you buy this, why, why did the mortuaries not work? It's like a fridge that's lukewarm. Mm. So the corpses hmm. composed. Now these people had to go and look, they didn't know where they were, they had to go and look for their relatives in all sorts of mortuaries and they find them decomposed. Now that's multiple jeopardy the pain of the death, and then you get there and you find the person and they are in a state that you don't want ever to see. Mm. So, it was just so bad in some, but forget the emotion. There are two things to me. One, is the constitution toothless? Does it make all these promises and there's no right of recourse? Only this morning somebody, a, ju a junior lecturer at the University of Free State said, I didn't quite understand your judgment how you could recover damages under the Constitution when the only place you can recover damages is the common law. Mm. That's part of my problem with the Academy, um, which actually, in effect, renders the Constitution to be ineffectual, mm. to incapable of enforcing and buttressing the kind of hurt that would come out of contravening its terms. And she was really asking, shouldn't, and what should I have done? Just said, oh, you boys and girls have behaved so badly, but there's no recourse. Because a common law doesn't recognize this form of injury. Mm. But the Constitution does. Mm. So that, was, that is why I wrote about that a bit in the book, but at the same time, just to remind us, Morogoro, Solomon Matlangu, the high ideals of self-reliance, and being committed to freedom. Even though it's an example about the ANC, but it's an example that holds good for all liberation movements. On the one end, and then life as a demani on the other end. Mm. They don't square up. Mm. And, 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 and that's why the two sit where they sit in the book, to try and make the point that we should do much better than our oppressors. We should, we, we, we the guys, and our people should know it when it's not okay. And they should be able to, to rise and say, no, this is not, this is not fine. Mm. We're not accepting this. Too long an answer. I'm sorry. So I'm much, running out of <laughs> So much food for thought. We are nearly run out of time. I'm going to hand over first to our host, the, the, the principal and vice chancellor of the University of Pretoria, Professor Cooper, for some closing words. Then I'm going to hand over to the dean, Professor Skuman, to thank the DCJ for this conversation, which continues. Uh, Professor Cooper is also a big champion of literacy. So we do encourage people to please buy the book. Don't get a pirated version. Buy the, a good copy of the book. And... Um, really experienced the, the, the really remarkable story of um, an, a, a really epic judicial career. Over to you, Professor Kupe. No, thank you, Dr. Modirin. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Chief Justice Emeritus. I think that one of the things that one has to put this carefully, because it's not generally true, and I don't want it to be misunderstood, is that institutional memory is lost across the African continent when people have had experiences like yours are not translated into books, archives of your papers and all of that. And that is the University of Pretoria, what we want to do, because we reposition as an African global university, is to begin to be part of processes of recovering that institutional memory and making it live for future generations. So events like these are part of that uh, larger process, if you like. And also that um, in all of the crises that the world faces, people blame everything on COVID these days. Actually, some of it has nothing to do with COVID. <laughs> the world and uh, South Africa and Africa was in a crisis. Is that I think rethinking the notion of being African and reimagining mm. Africa yes. and what it could be is going to be some of the wellsprings of creating a new and better continent, as they say, post-COVID-19. Mm. 
but uh, as I said, it had nothing to do with COVID as such. Mm -hmm. And so we'll also, also take responsibility for the universities failing to tap into the institutional memory by engaging people like yours, yourselves in multiple formats. And it's not just judges, politicians, economists, leading civil servants, men of the cloth and women of the cloth that have made huge contributions mm. should be some of the knowledge that decolonizes the universities. Mm. True. Mm. Dean? Yes, um, thank you, Dr. Madere. Um, first of all, I do have a um, few thank yous that I need to do. So the first one is to um, Pan Macmillan Publishers and in particular to Veronica Napier for helping um, to make all of this possible. And also thank you very much for the donation of a 30 copies of All Rise uh, to the faculty. We will um, allocate those wisely. Thank you very much, very much appreciated. And then I also want to um, thank Future Africa for the venue and logistics, as well as Louis Clutter uh, Productions uh, for organizing and setting this up for us this afternoon. Thank you very much. I also want to thank all the panelists for their presence here today and also for their contributions. And then finally, I want to thank you, Justice Museneke, for your valuable insights and also, above all, for your um, humanity this afternoon shown here. And I would like to extend an open invitation to you to come by the law school anytime you wish to do so. There will also be some formal invitations because we need to tap into this institutional knowledge and we um, stand to gain a lot from your experience. So thank you very much for taking the time to be with us um, here this afternoon. We know you have a very busy schedule, so it is very much appreciated. Thank you very much. Thank you. And so that brings us to the end of a long and wonderful conversation, which could, of course, always continue uh, right till the end of the end of the day. I want to also thank my fellow panelists, Professor Maimela, Professor Kupe, Deputy Chief Justice uh, Moseneke, and uh, Professor Skuman. Um, and uh, thank you very much to the production team that's made this such a smooth and efficient um, discussion. Uh, thank you very much, everyone, and uh, thank you for your time. Mm -hmm.